Coming up, the Alaska Permanent Fund, golden eggs from a golden goose. We're in the process of buying a new home and there'll be things we need it for. We're gonna put all of it away into the education pot. In the Constitution. But these days, the permanent fund seems to be a source of permanent frustration. Protect the PFD. Why some Alaskans feel they lost out. We don't necessarily have a math question uh, before us or an economics question. It's a values question. We're killing the goose that's laying the golden egg. We're killing it. Ahead, saving Alaska's golden goose. Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers. With challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief that the best is yet to come. Bringing you the faces, the places, and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. Welcome to Frontiers. As we look at what is a rite of passage for Alaskans, the arrival of the permanent fund dividend. For almost four decades, it's been like that proverbial golden goose that delivers to eligible Alaskans a golden egg of their very own. No matter where you go in Alaska these days, happiness seems to be in the air. And I'll do a peanut butter cookie. Perhaps it's the sound of money. Thanks to the dividend, Alaskans have cash to spend. They plan on having that golden egg once a year. Scott Brockett says he used his dividend once to buy his first car for school books. This year, he'll try to save it. But then again... We've got the Christmas coming up, um, Thanksgiving coming up. That's when family comes around. So it's really nice when family comes up here and visits because you have that little extra money. Oh my gosh, perfect. And behind the counter, you'll find Erica Merrill. In past years, she's used her check to pay for school clothes, a down payment for a car. This year... My children's father lives in Texas, and so I will be sending them to Texas at Christmas time, which is very expensive. When lawmakers rolled out the PFD program in 1980, they had no idea how successful it would be. At $1,606 this year, that's a lot of dough. But had the legislature used the traditional formula to calculate the dividend, it would have approached $3,000. In the Constitution, protect the PFD. Some continue to push for the full dividend. Others say they're glad the legislature used the cash from the fund's earnings account to help soften the governor's drastic budget cuts. Musin Gatabi and his colleagues here at the University of Alaska's Institute of Social and Economic Research say there's nothing like the permanent fund dividend program anywhere in the world. Some people have said that the permanent fund corpus is like the golden goose, Alaska's economic golden goose. There is no doubt about the fact that the permanent fund dividend has played an incredibly important role in the development of the Alaska economy. It helps people in numerous ways, some of which we don't even understand. But here's what ICER does know about what happens when dividend payments hit the state. For every hundred million dollars, for example, in dividends, there's somewhere between 450 and 700 jobs that are generated in the weeks and months following the distribution because it's almost like a second Christmas, right? And so money circulates in the economy. Retailers hire more people in order to deal with more people buying things. Even with a reduced dividend, there are lots of golden eggs to go around. This year at $1,600 per person, about a billion dollars hits people's bank accounts essentially on the same day. And that obviously has a lot of consequences on economic activity. Among those, a substantial reduction in Alaska's poverty rate and income inequality in both the short term and the long run especially in rural Alaska, where jobs and cash are hard to come by. The dividend helps families buy supplies for the winter and other basics, like gas for the boat to put fish on the dinner table. The research shows the dividend has a huge impact on health, 
perhaps because families are able to buy better quality food, which has also helped to improve birth weights and reduce childhood obesity. The research also suggests the dividend gives low-income families better access to health care. All of this from the earnings of the permanent fund. It's hard to believe this oil wealth savings account started in 1977 with only $734,000. Right now, the permanent fund dividend stands at about 63 or $64 billion with a B. So how do we keep from killing the golden goose? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a very difficult question. Judging by the last few years, obviously we've gone through multiple savings accounts, not the earnings reserve. And so if we overspend or overextend ourselves, there is certainly a risk of drawing too much, which potentially puts the earnings reserve uh, in jeopardy. And for investment purposes, the earnings reserve is part of the permanent fund. And if it shrinks, that hurts the fund's earning power. It's important to note that while the fund has done really well, it is still invested fairly aggressively, which means that a downturn in the national economy or a downturn in the stock market can decrease the value of the fund, which can change the conversation rather rapidly. With pressure to pay huge dividends while using the earnings to cover multi-billion dollar budget gaps and no plans for new sources of income, Gatabi says there's no permanent fix in sight, only gridlock. We don't necessarily have a math question uh, before us or an economics question. It's a values question. It's a political question about what matters right now, what matters for future generations. So how many years of doing nothing do we have left? <sighs> Difficult to say. The more money you draw from the fund, the less time you have to come up with a sustainable solution. So what you're saying is doing nothing is the surest way to kill the goose. There you go. So what's the smartest thing to do to save the goose? Think about not just the next year and next two years, think about the next 30 years and, and figure out what are the priorities. Um, there is no easy answer, unfortunately, because priorities differ from one person to another. That's it. Thank you. Some, like Rona Florio, say the priority should be on state services, not bigger dividends. In fact, she plans to give some of her PFD to a couple of nonprofits that were hit hard with budget cuts. I wish I could do something for Cordova because they don't have a ferry anymore. That really bothers me a lot. If I could wave a magic wand, I would, I would put it all into our public education system. But others say the state has an insatiable appetite that if not checked, will eventually gobble up our dividends. The problem isn't enough money. The problem is proper budgeting. Not everyone here at the bakery gets to enjoy a dividend. Ian Smith moved here recently from Massachusetts and says he could have used the money for child care. At this point, I'm probably more of an entertained observer. I have high hopes for our new state. I want us to do well. And that's the problem. There are no pastries in politics, mostly fiscal choices that aren't so easy to swallow. All righty. Have a good day, sir. So, if you saved every permanent fund dividend since the fund began in 1982, how much money would you have saved? We'll have the answer when we come back, and we will be joined by Jack Hickel and former Senate President Rick Halford. They're men on a mission. But first, a look back at PFDs of yesteryear.
So, in total, how much has the dividend paid out collectively over the years? Now, hold your breath here, gonna have a drum roll. $25 billion. Here's another number to think about. Let's say that you saved every dividend from the very beginning. How much would you have? Almost $45,000, and that's without interest figured in. But if you did factor a 3% interest rate, you'd have more than $70,000 in savings. And our two guests, Jack Hickel and Rick Halford, would probably agree that that's probably one of Alaska's biggest success stories. And uh, of course, people probably know your name, Jack, from your dad, Wally Hickel. And of course, Rick, you were Senate president and also involved in some of the permanent fund legislation back in the day. So I guess, you know, I, I want to start off by asking each of you, and we'll start with you, Rick. Uh, do you remember your first dividend and how you felt? Well, it was, it was kind of an amazing process that we ended up with it uh, because it was a court case on the first dividend. It was a backup dividend. I was the majority leader of the House when we finally passed it. Uh, and it was, it was hotly contested, and there were a lot of details. Uh, the, uh, the inclusion of, of kids, uh, the welfare hold harmless. A lot of things were designed to be sure that we were actually giving the grassroots, the bottom line people of Alaska, something in a time when they, there were huge unequal dividends going out in loan subsidies, in all kinds of programs and ideas as the oil production ramped up and the state's income grew astronomically. Jack, what were you doing when the first dividend came out? I was actually, had just moved to Africa, <clears throat> but I thought... You were practicing medicine there. <laughs> yes, I was, <clears throat> and uh, raised my family there for 16 years. But I thought, this is really an interesting concept that the Alaskans have, have dove into. I thought, commonly owned resources, and now we're getting a dividend from that. I thought, what an interesting model, which my father eventually called the owner state and popularized that idea. Well, you know, there is a lot of divisiveness right now, and, and, and of course, your group, the Permanent Fund Defenders, uh, they seem to be on a pretty wide spectrum of how to solve this sort of impasse that we have over the future of the dividend, whether to use some of the earnings to fund government, uh, whether to tax, uh, find various solutions. But so what does the Defender stand for? What is the core principle that unites them together? Go ahead. Well, <clears throat> our core principle is the resources in this state are owned in common by the people. And that those resources are held in trust by the government to benefit the people. And the dividend, the permanent fund, is a way of saving those that non-sustainable, non-renewable resource oil and co converting it into a sustainable resource, the permanent fund. Our core value is that the permanent fund, and we are the permanent fund defenders, the best way the fund can be defended is having a, a, a solid, safe dividend. That keeps the people connected with what's going on in the dividend, keeps them connected with how government is spending money. And our 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 way of doing this, protecting the dividend, is let's get the dividend off the budget table. It causes nothing but chaos in the legislative system. They all want to spend it. Government is trying to convince the people that the dividend is a generous gift from government to the people. That's the wrong narrative. The dividend belongs to the people. It needs to be protected. And our bottom line is we need to get the dividend protected in the Alaska Constitution by a vote of the people. So I'm, I just want to stop here and just kind of look at, at, at what uh, the dividend cuts have been and, and how they add up. So we've got some numbers here for you to look at. The very first one shows uh, what the shortfall was in the dividend checks going to 2016 and back. And each year the dividend was cut by that amount. And so actually it adds up to about $5,000 that, that the public didn't get had the traditional dividend formula been used. And I want to show you another a set of numbers here. This is looking at what households lost. So like if you had a family of five, you would have lost close to $25,000. What do these numbers say to you? That's the reason for the breadth and the depth of the recession that Alaska has been in. The recession came from 
the oil industry. It was going to affect Alaska in many ways. But by going after the dividend first, it took out of the economy all across the state to the smallest village in every place. It took out of the economy those huge numbers and that affected everyone much, much more directly and much faster than it would have if the recession in the oil patch had gone through and changed the structure that it did uh, and gone by. But Basically, were we're still in the recession caused by taking that much money out of every town and village across the state. I don't know if every economist would agree with you on that because those were super dividends that were trimmed. So people still got a substantial dividend in that. And, and what would be worse, though, to have cut the budget to the point that people would then lose a lot of services that sustain them? I, I don't think that that choice is is necessarily the right choice. Uh, and I am not talking about taxes or what taxes or what fees or what budget issues. I think the point that we make and the point we agree on is that the last place to go should be the permanent fund system and the permanent fund dividend. That is the one most regressive, by every economic analysis, most regressive way to, to get money. It's taken only from Alaskans. It's taken from children and it's taken backwards to any tax you could possibly have. It's the worst kind of a tax. It doesn't mean that we choose and uh, the advocates in the permanent fund defenders choose between the other alternatives. But it's people that say that one should be off the table. But people say that, that worry about government services, they say, you know, how can we justify cutting things like power equalization or trimming uh, the university by 130 million or programs for the elderly by paying a $3,000 dividend, which would have well, been this year's dividend. Can you, can you say the same thing about just one year, full dividend, just don't pay the oil tax credits that are not a legal obligation? You could say uh, what we've spent in advocating for a gas line that seems to be going nowhere. That's a full year of adding back in the dividends. And you can go down that list. Instead of going to basic services, go to the things that people would really identify because that's where their dividends went. All right, well, we'll leave it here, but uh, Dr. Jack Hickel and Rick Halford are going to stay with us to weigh in on how might we resolve this problem. The permanent fund dividend has become almost a permanent source of angst and controversy. And Dr. Jack Hickel and former Senate President Rick Halford are here with their thoughts on how we might break this political gridlock. But first, I want to take a look at something that uh, your father, Governor Wally Hickel, passed out, a, a certificate. Can you explain what this is all about? Yes, when he was governor, he put out a certificate of ownership, which he wanted to distribute to all Alaskan citizens, basically telling them that, and if you could read it, the print is small, it says, citizens of Alaska, you are owners of this oil wealth. It is yours, you need to be responsible with it. You also have a dividend which comes to you as a result of your ownership in the commonly owned resources. And his, his thought on this was, if we can use natural resources to pay a dividend to people, you can help alleviate poverty. And even on a world level, if other nations follow the same model that we are trying to protect and expand on, other nations can also address world poverty. And this has a, a, a real strong foothold in many nations in America. Well, you know, They're I, looking at this. I hear that there is a lot of discussion now with Andrew Yang's candidacy for the uh, Democrats. Uh, that, that that idea of guaranteed income has come up and people are looking to the permanent fund uh, program for that. It's totally, he's talking about universal basic income. Right. Universal basic income is based on taxing people to pay a, per, a, a universal basic income to the poor. Our model is different. Our, our dividend is not based on taxing people. It's based on people's earned income from their <clears throat> ownership of resources. It's a different model. So let me ask you this, <clears throat> uh, because if, if this model, if we carry it one step further, mm -hmm. so we are 
uh, shareholders in a corporation, the state of Alaska, and our, our legislators and our governor are kind of like the executive board. And a lot of times, if you own shares in a company, sometimes if things aren't going well for the company, they don't give you a dividend or they reduce it. So what's wrong with the legislature treating us like shareholders of other kinds of companies? The system already does that. That's why the dividends have gone up and down because it's based on the five-year average income of the fund itself. It's directly connected to the fund to give people an incentive to be concerned about bad investment, about bad policies, about where the money is, and how it's taken care of. So it gives people exactly what the stock market does in the same sense of the board of directors of a company. It already operates that way, and there's never been any complaint by people when the dividend went down because the market went down because they understood that. So they that's felt how the it connection and it works and it's what protected the fund. So that's how it kind of works like a company, so to exactly. speak. So how are we going to get out of this gridlock? Because because even in your organization there is a wide spectrum of how to solve this. Jack said this very well. The the first step is take the permanent fund system off the table. This is the one small piece that was passed on to individuals to protect the large piece passed on to the next generation, the principle of the fund itself. But take that off the table, and like every other jurisdiction in the country, taxes and services and fees and resources will all be considered in some combination so that people can get what they need, pay for it in some way, and have it, but not go only to the one source that takes, takes from Alaskans only in the most regressive possible way. So, going forward though, we've got to have some kind of a compromise. It, it can't be all black and white one way or another. How do we, how do we go forward? Keep in mind that the dividend, since it belongs to the people, <clears throat> any change to the dividend process, including the formula by which it's calculated, needs to be voted upon by the people. It can't be government taking away from what belongs to the people without their approval. So people need, the government needs to realize no change to the statutory law, uh, no taking the dividend, or, or, or uh, touching the permanent fund without the people voting on it. It needs to be put in the Constitution, People would vote on this, it'd be protected. From that point on, we can begin the real dialogue of how to solve the budgetary crisis. There's many options, as Rick has talked about, there's many options that we can approach. Fair budget cuts, and I mean fair budget cuts. Fair revenue generation by whatever avenue that can be done. Well, I'm going to have to leave it there. It's a great discussion, but we'll have to leave it there. But uh, we also want to say that there are many other perspectives in this debate, and we'll just have to continue the conversation at a future date. This show is by no means the last word on the permanent fund dividend. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week.